ready. Good evening. Today is Wednesday, March 16th, 2022, and this is the regular meeting of the Oregon City City Commission. Mr. Riley, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Denise McGriff. Present. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Here. Commissioner Adam Marl. Here. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Here. And Mayor Rachel Lyle Smith. Here. Will you all please join me in the flag salute? All right, so we do not have any ceremonies and proclamations, so we'll move on to citizen comment. I have quite a number here, so uh, I'll call two names at a time. Um, for you two to come up, both mics are working. So you can come up, take a seat. Uh, please state your name and city of residence for the record. You'll have three minutes unless you're representing a neighborhood association. Um, so first I have Dan Fowler and then Paul Edgar. And the green light should be on for your microphone. Testing, yep, yep. done. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Um, and uh, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. I rarely speak, even though that in 25 years, I haven't been here very often. Um, but tonight, I think I wanna say a few words that I feel are important. Can we get your name in your city presence? Dan Fowler, sorry, <laughs> Oregon City. Thank you. You should know that, right, Dan? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, first, a little vision of Oregon City. I think Oregon City is really on the move. And I know each of you care about it deeply. When I look around Oregon City right now, I see it growing. I see potential everywhere. I see opportunity in the North End for mixed use housing and shopping. I know there's a hotel that's about ready to break ground this summer. I think there's opportunity for senior housing that I've heard about. When I think about downtown, of course, we've got Oregon City Brew that's expanding, Corner 14's in. It's vibrant. Hilltop, we've got things going on in the industrial area. We've got housing that's going to happen on Maple Lane. You know, the city's really going. And an important part of our city is a river. The river is the economic engine of our town, just like tourism. It is actually fishing is tourism, but this history is important. When uh, this last summer we had people at Corner 14 who brought a paddleboard every Tuesday. They met there and they had lunch or dinner. And they took their paddle boards with a little wheel on the back and they rolled it down to the sports craft landing and they went off the dock there and got in the river and paddleboarded. They had an exercise class. They had a yoga class on his paddleboard, believe it or not. My point in saying that is, I know you're looking at issues with Sportcraft Landing. I get it. And I know that there's not a lot of opportunity for us as citizens to speak about it. So I wanted to do that tonight. It's a business that's been in town for a long time. When I said as mayor, we gave them a long-term lease. I'm not saying it's perfect, and I'm not saying conditions are, aren't different. But I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do as a commission, as our representatives of the people, is to be reasonable, be fair, of course look after the city, but every once in a while stop and look through the eyes of the business. Just for a moment, pretend that you are that business, that you have been there for 55 years, and you've provided service. That you've given voters gas, the only place between here and the Columbia River. So just, I, I know there's a lot of issues around it, I, I do, but I want them to stay. I think they're important. They help create what I feel is the vibe of our community. There's a real buzz about Oregon City. The businesses are busy, the restaurants are going, I think we have a really good thing going on, and a big, big part of that is our river, which provides fishing, boating, canoeing, kayaking, and sportcraft is a big part of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank Paul you. Edgar. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Paul Edgar, and I'm also from Oregon City. The last
last work session was on economic development. And part of that economic development presentation was on retention. And another element of it is what are some of the key attractions that bring people here and allow them to connect with Oregon City and spend money in Oregon City? That sports craft a marina there. And I also spent some time in an early life in Alaska. And fishing has always been part of my life. And all I can turn around and tell you is, is that if you want to find a wild crowd that cares a lot and spends some money, and when it comes to fishing, they'll buy boats, and we have a boat sales place right on, on McLaughlin right there, and we have all of these things which relate to it. We have a wonderful uh, sporting goods store in Oregon City Shopping Center. But all of this connects. You connect all the dots. You connect it to a major attraction, and as Dan talked about, the river and the people that come there and enjoy it, see it, and it's part of our lives. And I think that every effort should be made to work with Sportscraft Marina, ODOT, and all of the players that have something that could uh, to say or to do to find out the way we can. Uh, enhance that opportunity because it's more than just business retention. This is something that truly attracts people to Oregon City in a manner that and they that few businesses do. They come. We should take full advantage of it. And I, I just hope that you will understand and appreciate it as I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. Next, we have Wade Byers and Eric Dye. Good evening. I'm Wade Byers. I live in Gladstone. I'm here representing uh, Gail Yazzolino, who's the executive director of the End of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center and Visitors Information Center, and I'm a board member in that organization. So uh, she asked me to read her letter. Uh, Oregon City Mayor Rachel Lyle Smith, Commissioners Rocky Smith, Denise McGriff, Frank O'Donnell, and Adam Morrow. Topic is support for Sportcraft Marina and Landing. Dear Oregon City Mayor and Commissioners, the renewal of the lease of the Sportcraft Landing is a very touchy subject and as elected leaders, we look to you to help make our community work. It is not easy. Sometimes we have to compromise to get things done. This is what I know. This 52 year old family business has a significant effect on the tourism, fishing, boating and water sports industries. It helps to attract a significant number of visitors to Oregon City as well as to serving its residents. We cannot lose this business because people aren't willing to talk. There must be a solution, and no offense to attorneys, uh, that's how Gail would say it. Uh, it will need to be found by leaders working with staff and the business to find a reasonable solution all parties can live with. Please do, do all you can to get this lease renewed and this business in Oregon City. Thank you. We are much stronger together, and Gail wanted me to note that uh, one of our board members, uh, who was a city commissioner, Rocky Smith has recused himself from participating in this uh, at our organization. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dye. Hi, my name is Eric Dye and I live in Oregon City. I am the owner of Sportcraft Landing. Our family has owned this marina since 1969 and it was built with the handshake deals and, and the encouragement from the city staff over the many years to what it is today. Over 52 years, this has been our business, our home, and our future for our kids. Over many years, our future at the marina has been uncertain, going from 20-year lease agreements to five years to one-year agreements. In the last two and a half years, no real lease at all. We patiently waited to hear to negotiate a new longer-term agreement with the city, but with no conversations, no, no negotiations from the city, we received a letter of intent 
with the city's new demands. The new requirements will increase our lease agreement from $20,000 a year to over $84,000 a year. It will require us to triple our insurance cost. It will require me to carry a security bond to cover the cost of removing two thirds of our marina docks and pilings, basically a plan to vacate the area. And lastly, sign off on pursuing any access to our privately owned river frontage and our DSL leased area. All this with an offer of a one year lease term, which is now nine months old and going to expire this July. This requirement will cost us over $80,000 per year to operate. And with all this said, we have agreed to all the demands to secure the future of the marina because we feel we are a vital part of the city and surrounding communities. We have a very large support group with hundreds of mortgage customers, fishermen, and fishing guides, along with the rec recreational boaters that has made us a destination point to refuel at the only fuel dock on the Willamette River, grab a snack, or visit the downtown area. The marina becomes a very busy place in the spring and summer with the kayaking, the paddle boarding groups, the fuel dock, the full mortgage with monthly and yearly customers. We are also the home to the Clackamas County Marine Patrol, which was chosen by them for us to build them a new facility because we were the only location feasible for their needs. Tonight, I'm hoping we can work together, have the discussions needed to resolve the issues to keep our marina. In my business over 30 years, I've learned the in and outs of developing the waterways in this area. If we are not renewed July 1 and forced to remove all improvements from the city's two DSL leased areas, it would be very unlikely a new development in those locations would be allowed. I've spoken to the major agencies regarding this situation. After 52 years, Sportcraft is grandfathered in and is not held to today's standards. It makes the most sense to repair our relationship, come up with new ideas, work together, and move forward. I have offered a generous improvement plan to the South Dock areas to improve the looks of the marina, standing from the upland boardwalk area off McLaughlin. I have given the details and lease needs to accomplish these improvements in our letter that was sent to all of you. Noting that this is impossible to make these investments with a short-term lease. Yes, there's been frustrations when all we've heard from the staff is that the commission's main concern is an eviction plan. How are the dyes going to be removed from the area? Um, Mr. Dye, you're out of time. I'm out of time. I came to the end. I'm just hoping we can start that new conversation and, and work out these possibilities in our marina. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, next we have Pete Tracy and Michaela Barron. Pete, you're next. Uh, All right. Hi, my name's Pete Tracy. I live over in Gladstone, Oregon. Uh, Mayor, Commissioner, thanks for letting me speak a little bit here. Uh, I've, I've got a, a little word that my wife, my, my children and my grandchildren have helped me write. Uh, it'll be far shorter in three minutes. So I'm here talking about Sportcraft Landing. We, us as a family, have been recreating on this river since 75, 45 years, you know, 50 years. I've been dealing with the Dye family for that many years. I dealt with Eric's father, then I dealt with Eric's brother, Chris, and now I'm dealing with Eric and Kim now today. I'm a year-round more down there. So the decisions we make today are affecting a lot of other people than just Oregon City. Uh, I want to first, you know, start with my relationship started in 75 with the Dye family. My children didn't come into me until into the 90s, and now my grandchildren are here as teenagers out of Gladstone using these facilities. Our waterways are as important to me in Gladstone as they are here to Oregon City to you good folks. Uh, I, I've also volunteered and was Parks and Recreation Commissioner in Gladstone for many years. So I fought many good fights for our little waterway we call Meldrum Bar 
which were neighbors across the river. Uh, the, the, the opportunity we have here to keep sport craft open isn't just for merely fishermen, it's for the, the water skiers, the recreation users, and as, as, as I've heard from the other uh, speakers up here, it's the only place I can buy gas on the Willamette River. I used to have multiple choices. I don't have that no more. If I don't buy it up on the road and drag it down now, I've got problems. And it's sure it's convenient that that family has kept that facility open. And I know that's a hardship every year. Uh, paddle boarders, kayakers, and alike enjoy recreating there. As, as much as they do at your little Clackman Park, they've closed our boat ramp there, as you all know. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been talking with Steve Williams on how we can resolve that as members from both sides of the river because it's very important. Uh, and then we're going to have the construction there affecting, uh, affecting our boat ramp at Sportcraft. Uh, please take a real hard look at Eric and Kim. They do a great job. They're wonderful uh, business owners here in Oregon City, very generous with their time. Uh, please consider their long-term lease. I've been here for 45 years using it, so thank you very much for letting me speak. All right, thank you. Michaela? Hi, um, I'm Michaela Barron. Uh, I live in Wilsonville. Um, I'm here to represent Energy Kayaking um, and as an active community member. As you may know, our business is located down on the docks at Sportcraft Landing and supplies the community with tools and resources they need to enjoy the river easily and safely. Uh, community members and people outside our community come to Sportcraft Landing to support local artists, the historical landmarks, and to learn about the history that makes Oregon City unique. I have resided here in Oregon City for 20 years um, and have been part of the kayaking community for 12. When I was 11 years old, I started volunteering for We Love Clean Rivers and we clean up the entire Clackamas River. <laughs> um, and through that, I met Sam Drabo, who is the owner of Energy Kayaking. And I got to know him and I've been part of his team. And all we do is... Uh, been countless hours giving and working for this community um, and honestly the community is thriving from it. I spend my weekdays working as a grad mentor at a high school. Um, my, purpose to, my purpose is to help better our kids so that way they can be ready for this world. Um, and the most common comment I get is how does this apply to real life? Not everything we learn in the educational system is utilized after graduation. These kids need after school programs where they can learn and understand reality. They can um, explore activities they can't experience with technology. Energy kayaking provides these programs. We have after school programs, summer camps, we have a kayak team that actually goes year-round. Um, if our access to the docks at Sportscraft Landing ceases, then the growth and development of the community will be hindered. hindered. Um, not just because it's the main and best point of river access in the Willamette, or because of energy kayaking. It's because of how our community utilizes the space, how ladies of the water uh, get together and bond, and how local artists come out and our community goes out with them and supports them. And also, everyone here likes to go down to the river and relax, get rid of some stress, it's pretty nice. I mean, everyone, including handicapped, go down there. Um, our business helps with that, too. And so my hope, come down and enjoy it. All right, thank you. All right, next I have Roger Dolan. Oh, or Roland. Sorry, I couldn't tell it was RRD. Roger Roland and Kent Ziegler. Thank you, 
for the opportunity. Roger Rule in Oregon City. Um, I've lived here for 44 years, um, and I'm here really for as a fisherman and um, primarily for fishing. But um, uh, I've been here for 44 years and and done that primarily. But my in-law family, the Anderson family, the uh, uh, Alec family been over here for more than 90 years. Um, historically, they have uh, used this river for a long time in that manner, but uh, the Dye family has been here for 50 years plus, and I know they have helped this community uh, in, in, uh, for, for a long time and for uh, greatly. Uh, Sports Crack Marina has a positive influence with uh, ODF and W, uh, with uh, the sheriff's department, as, we, as we've heard. Um, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how how much their influence with the economy. I've spent, uh, I spend, and somebody mentioned this. This uh, sports fisherman has spent <laughs> countless money uh, uh, on that river, uh, bringing that money to. Uh, this community. Um, please have conversations, and I've, I've heard this throughout uh, with conversations with Eric and uh, Kim. Um, please have conversations. That's that's what we do here in, in Oregon City. This community is a fantastic community. We work together, and you can see that throughout. We work together. We have conversations together. Please have a conversation with them. Um, don't, uh, don't, don't, do not just do the legal stuff and not have conversation. Um, please have them, let them allow that conversation and continue their business. Please look at their lease, uh, give them their lease. Thank you. Okay. Mayor Smith, Commission President McGriff, Commissioners Rocky Smith and Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Good to see all of you again. Uh, Commissioner Marles online. You're always <laughs> invited to come to our Oregon City Business Alliance forums at any time. Uh, next Tuesday, we have a forum coming up. I hope each of you could either watch it on Zoom or attend in person. Don't forget Commissioner Marl. He's online. You left oh, him out. Oh, okay. I, I, excuse me, I apologize, Adam, uh, you're, you're invited as well to come to our forum. Well, I like so many others that have been up here tonight giving testimony, uh, just really have been given this a lot of thought. I grew up in Oregon City, I graduated from Oregon City High School, I've known the Willamette River for such a long time, as a part of my life, and as president of the Oregon City Business Alliance, we, we keep asking ourselves, why, why are we having this conversation? What, what is the motivation behind taking a business that's been in existence for over 50 years, providing a very vital service to Oregon City, um, not only economically, but recreationally, and, and just bringing everyone together in a holistic way, a uh, synergistic way. And I'm going, why are we having this conversation? And when I asked the dies, they couldn't give me a good answer. Um, I'm hoping staff or you or someone will be able to do that. But I think we all realize the value that the river does provide Oregon City. This city is very fortunate to have that asset at its doorstep. Uh, we look at what's taking place at the Blue Heron site with the Confederated Tribe of the Grand Rod. What could potentially take place in the North End District with a multitude of new development opportunities. But they all could converge somehow through a master plan to utilize the river. And we think about taking a marina away, it's difficult to get a marina approved. In fact, in talking with the dyes, it's probably impossible to get another marina to go into that location because of the depth of the water being fairly shallow. And they're grandfathered in. They've been there for over 50 years. So you have an asset that is so valuable. To me, the last thing you want to do is cause them issues, cause them financial difficulties. Uh, rather, I would say, let's proactively, as your economic development manager, James Grand, might say, let's find a way to spearhead and 
leverage this asset as the mill transforms into this amazing tourist opportunity, why not use the marina as a vehicle to go ahead and take tourism, allow people to park at Clackamas Park and use the marina as a way to get up close and experience the falls in a way they never can. Uh, I had the opportunity to do that at the marina. Mayor Smith, you were on the same boat with us. It was a tremendous opportunity to be up close. And I think everyone uh, that comes to Oregon City should have that same experience. So I, like the others that have spoken, I just ask that you give, um, give time to really look at how can we make this work? How can we create a win-win? You have a tremendous, valuable resource here. How can you integrate that into your short and long-range goals? So um, I'm speaking by myself, but I share the views of my board at the Oregon City Business Alliance when I say that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next I have Jerry Herman and Elizabeth Morris. Jerry? Jerry, we call him in order. You want to go? <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace, Jerry. He's not, You're up, he's Jerry. not listening oh, okay. to me. Okay, I'm sorry. I was giving the lady the deference of the day. I'm Jerry Herman. I'm a resident of Gladstone, and I was one of the first, was the first formal tour operator in Oregon City with a vessel called Enviro Trekker, which took 5,000 people over a four year period on free cruises that departed from a sport craft marina return them there. This is before John Storm Park Dock. Through the Environmental Learning Center that I operated for 25 years with the college, we did 30 steady cruises about the Willamette that left Sportcraft Landing and proceeded through Willamette Falls Locks all the way to Shampooey Newburgh or all the way to Astoria or turning right up the Columbia, the Cascade Locks, Hood River and the Dalles. Those cruises took hundreds of teachers on them to learn about the river. There was no John Storm Park dock at that time. A number of uh, <clears throat> Rose Festival cruises, eight to be exact, left that dock, Sportcraft, when there was no John Storm Park. And all this time, the owners were generous enough to help us work with our vessel, Enviro Trekker, help us build the vessel into what it was, capable of doing tours, and more importantly, never charged a dime for those services. You might have read something about our vessel being sunk by sea lions. That is true. You cannot believe how many vessels have been damaged by sea lions at the Sportcraft Marina. Some of you or some of your staff asked me to look at other marinas all the way down to Astoria and look at what they do down there. What are their problems? What do they look like? Some are very beautiful, but they're in a section of the river dynamic where a 10 or 15 foot rise would be very, very bad. Here it's 48 feet. They're all suffering from sea lions, as we have been here. The reason I'm here tonight is to tell you, yes, the vessel sank. It was in the paper. It's being restored now. Sea lions got in it, and a seven-foot-tall um, sea lion, a much bigger one from Alaska, was in my way. I'll have to say the sea lions got out, and I nearly got eaten by the <clears throat> larger sea lion. One way or the other, that's been an impact there. These folks can't operate with a short lease. They need some kind of credibility over time. You have a perfect storm now. ODOT is bringing a huge amount of money into that vessel, that vessel service area, that marina operation to help them restore it, make it improvements on the upper side where they can no longer operate on the lower side. They'll be able to make those improvements there. Yes, I may be out, out of line by talking to you, but most of these deliberations have been mostly behind doors, as we understand. I think it's time that the community input be heard from you. We'd like you all, and we trust you all, to do the right thing on this subject. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. I'm grateful that Jerry did not end up being sea lion bait. <laughs> yeah. I would have paid to watch Jerry wrestle a sea lion. <laughs> I think Jerry was smart and, and left, because those are not, you don't want to mess with one of those critters. All right, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks, you guys, so much for hearing us out. Um, Your and name and city for the record. I'm sorry to interrupt. My name's Elizabeth Morris. And city residence. Oregon City. Okay, thanks. 
Um, yeah, you guys are my neighbors, and I really appreciate uh, the support. Um, so I, I'm here, I want to re read a prepared statement about um, water access. It's so important to me, I want to be able to say everything, so I just made a little prepared statement here, if you let me read this. Um, I'd like to testify about protecting equitable access to the Willamette River from Oregon City. Uh, I'm Liz Morris. My husband and I are restoring a historic home in the McLaughlin neighborhood. We have a year-round slip at the Sportcraft Landing we have for a couple of years now. Um, we moved to our neighborhood, like so many others in our community and on our streets, specifically due to the walkable access to the river and to the marina. It's a core part of our life. It's why we're here. This entire the entire history of this city, even before it was called Oregon City, is human interaction with the river, and that's really lamp limited so much on the Willamette. We're not a wealthy community like Selwood or Portland or Lake Oswego where we could afford tens of thousands of dollars for these yachts and boat slips. Um, the marina offers affordable boat slips, watercraft rentals, and a lot of really fun events that would be otherwise inaccessible to most of our community. The marina brings local businesses, it brings jobs, but it also stimulates a love of nature. My career and my husband's career are entirely focused on environmental remediation and protecting Oregon's rivers, especially the Willamette. I invite anyone here to take a ride with us on our little boat, watch the great blue heron roost by the dozens, watch the fish jump, or sometimes the sea lions, which can be kind of scary, uh, watch the osprey and the eagles dive, and get to know the islands and the coves, and truly see the heartbeat of Oregon City in a way that you just cannot from the shore or from any other part. We should be stimulating river access and never limiting it. The kayak rental offers equitable water access to all income levels. The public Oregon City boat ramp is already too small for the people trying to access it. You could wait for hours, and sometimes there's just not even parking at all for boats, so it's not a viable alternative even already. Closing the marina will effectively cut off river access to so much of our community. I don't know the history at all of the marina or the commission or anything else at all. I really don't know the background, but it is that marina is a central part of my life and my community. Um, I really would not stay here probably if the marina were closed. So I'd like to invite our community to work together to keep open and equitable access to the river, the marina, and craft rentals as a key part of the city's history and our future. Thank you so much for the work you're doing for our community. Thank you. All right, you all are doing so good with staying with your, are really close to your three minutes. Um, and I have the final card is another one from Kent. Are you speaking on another topic or do I just have two cards for you? I couldn't find the first one, so you got a separate one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got it. Okay, okay, cool. Um, well, I think, is that everybody? Is everybody that wanted to give citizen comment tonight? Do we have anybody, Jacob, online? Not to my knowledge. Okay. But I'd appreciate it if they raised their hand. If they did, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Did you have something to say? I, I think the comments deserve a response. And, Are you, and yeah, I'd, I like to make, I'd like to make one. Okay, go ahead. So those of you who know me know that I'm a fisherman, a boater, a kayaker, I've drifted rivers in drift boats and rafts, kind of be a self-described river rat. I have, I own five kayaks. I recently put in down there at, at the Sportcraft ramp, went up above to, all the way to the falls, which can be a bit intimidating, I'll tell you. But I understand the value of a river, and I understand it in my duties up here. It's as part of our economic development plan, for those of you who don't know, I'm trying to bring tour vessels to this city that we could disembark in. For those of you that ever taken a, a cruise, to do that very thing, disembark and then take land-based tours. I mean, if that's not a win-win for everybody, I don't know what is. And I'll tell you, there's obstructions to that, but I don't want to get sidetracked by that. The other part that I have to comment to you as, and I'm going to do this in general terms, if I overstep, you stop me. <laughs> I also have a duty to this city, and I'm also a businessman. I'm a businessman much like Ken Ziegler, 
much like their former mayor, Dan Fowler, and others in the audience that understand the nature of business. And I also have a fiduciary duty to the city. And from a business perspective, in general terms, general terms, the nature of business, I, I'm going to take a, a moment. I get the impression sitting here that, that this group feels that the city is not interested in having a marina operated, that, this, that the city is the problem in moving forward. And we're, we're, we have to watch what we say, but I don't think everybody knows all sides of the story. And I don't know if I'm, I don't believe I'm free to speak about it. So I'm gonna speak in general terms. In any business relationship, the basis of a business relationship is each party says what they're gonna do and does what they said they do. That doesn't happen, that relationship fails. It comes to an end. It'll be terminated by one party or the other. The also the other basis of a business relationship is contractual commitments are accepted and honored. Again, you say what you're gonna do, you do it. I do what I said I'm gonna do. No one up here believes we shouldn't have a marina. I believe in the marina. I mean, I believe in it for all the reasons I said, both personal and from a business development standpoint. The question is, who shall operate it and what? And will they fulfill their obligations? Have they fulfilled their obligations? Are they good business partners? Whoever that may be, and I'll keep that statement general, whoever they may be, whoever we enter into business with as a city has to do those things. So if you don't think every effort is being made and you think the city's at fault, maybe you ought to think again because there's a lot of rumors floating around and most of them are misinformed and, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, you folks, I mean, I'm a river person. I want a marina there. We want a marina there, but we want all parties to it to act in a, in a business-like manner. And I'll just say that in general terms. I hope that's, that's okay. Well, you've already said them, so. <laughs> well, that's not okay. I'm, I'm speaking as just another, another resident no, of Oregon City. It doesn't work that way. You can't take that back. We're at the diet. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I've, um, I've, I've said what I said. So, so yeah, I don't, I agree. It's been challenging uh, because I think there are some clearly some conceptions about what we think about the marina or about wanting to have a marina and um, you know and so but unfortunately because this is something that is a legal matter we're, we're we don't talk about it we've had a bunch of people call us I think every single one of us has had phone calls um, I appreciate it we've heard you um, and um, but we are we are not free to discuss anymore. In fact, Commissioner O'Donnell was walking a very very tight, wiggly rope that he was going about to fall off of. So, um, I don't think that any of us can say anything else. I appreciate you coming tonight um, to express the opinions of the community. It's unfortunate that we feel like we're not able to actually share a lot of our um, opinions or personal opinions until all of this gets resolved. But um, thanks for coming and for honoring our, our citizen comment time um, and providing your input. I had one thing. It's, it's, it's just a thank you. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to um, sp speak and say thank you to uh, everyone who came tonight. I know that people's time is valuable, and uh, I don't take your comments lightly, but I will have to concur with what my other commissioners said, and those of you that I responded to by email and I told you that I really couldn't discuss this, that is true. I, we cannot, and I concur with what Mayor Lyle Smith said. Uh, there is, as I've stated many times to people I know in this room personally, there is more here than meets the eye. So that's why I will just leave it at that. But thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. It's uh, nice to not be out here looking at an empty room. Uh, so it's nice to see people and faces, and it's actually nice to see your faces. Yes. So thank you again on myself behalf on behalf of myself and uh, those of you that I know personally I will thank you personally for coming when I see you so thank you all right so um, seeing no more citizen comment we're going to move on in the agenda um, I know we have an exciting agenda but I'm not wouldn't be surprised if you all marched out of here um, 
you're free to stay. We'll give them all a minute to exit if they're going to exit. Our next presentations, the presenters can go ahead and come on up. All right, so moving on in the agenda, we're at presentations. We have a presentation on the great, from the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council and the annual report. So whenever you are ready, gentlemen, can you please introduce yourself? We don't have a staff report, so I don't even have a name. I know Doug, but I don't have a name, so go ahead and get started. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Tom Gaskill, and I'm the Executive Director for the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Uh, I live in Portland, but I work in Oregon City and pleased to do so. I'm Doug Neely. I'm the Chair of the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. <clears throat> I want to thank you um, for giving us the opportunity tonight to present to you about uh, the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council and uh, to share our annual report. I provided a hard copy for each of you and feel free to follow along or uh, read it over breakfast tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, I outlined uh, the things that I'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, this has been a big year for this council and uh, we'll be highlighting uh, transitions and capacity building. Uh, we'll also talk about our strategic restoration action plan and then several different projects uh, that I'd like to kind of walk you through. I think it was interesting uh, listening to the previous uh, citizen input because I can see that uh, the city cares about its waterways and the magnificence of uh, the waterway of the Willamette and, uh, and all that that encompasses is complemented really by the creeks that we care for uh, that feed into the Willamette and so as we present tonight, I just want to share with you kind of another part of the city and uh, the community that cares about water. All right, and I guess I've got control of the slides. Wow. All right. There we go. Yeah, Doug, go ahead and well, introduce history to us. All right. The uh, Greater Oregon City Watershed Council was founded in 2004. 2005, this, the City Commission, Oregon City Commission, recognized it formally, as did the Board of uh, County Commissioners. We are a 501c3 organization. Uh, our, our, base, our basins we cover are the tributaries to the Willamette River between, but not including, the rivers of Clackamas and also of Malala. Uh, and so we're focused primarily, our activities are focused on Abernathy Creek, but we also have, uh, uh, our, our watershed includes the Beaver Creek, Parrot Creek uh, watershed. All right, and uh, the graphic up there, it's kind of hard to read, but you've got a better graphic in your, in your pack if you, packet if you would like to look at it. But uh, this really recaps what Doug was just talking about. So we're, in terms of uh, watershed councils around Oregon, um, we're a fairly small watershed council, and uh, we are focused on a very specific geography. Uh, but one of the exciting things I think about this watershed council and what attracted me to, to come and work for these folks is uh, the commitment. So Doug mentioned that this started in 2004. There's a founder right there. And uh, there are three. I'm one, I'm one, I'm one, one, one. Right, right. One of the founders. Yes, I know that. And, and so we've got two other founders still on our board. Um, so this, this shows you, you know, people that are really committed and love what, what this is about and have given so much. Um, our work uh, involves habitat restoration. It involves invasive species removal and native restoration of plants. Uh, technical assistance, so trying to, we can't do this alone and we can't do it simply by project by project, so we really need to elevate uh, the understanding within the community and within the watershed for what we call stakeholders. And so I, I mentioned stakeholder engagement there at the end. Uh, and you know, I've, I've worked around watershed councils for uh, over 30 years in my career. Um, my, my background is in biology. I worked on the Southern Oregon coast uh, for 25 years of my life uh, with a National Estuarine Research Reserve there, uh, leading their education and outreach efforts. And I really feel that elevating community understanding of the work that we do is essential. And I think it's one of the reasons that I was brought on board 
uh, by the council is because I do understand that. So I want to uh, step now into some transitions that have taken place recently. Uh, you may have met my predecessor, Rita Baker. Uh, Rita worked for the council for 13 years. She worked part-time, and I know that the better part of that was a lot of work that she was doing because she loved it and not because she was getting paid for it. Uh, and she really laid the foundation uh, that I am inheriting uh, with the work that, that I am doing. So um, one of the first things that uh, the council had listed on their strategic plan was to establish an office. And so we did that in the historic Kruger House. And I have to say, when I first moved in there, I wondered whether there were ghosts upstairs because it was a little bit quiet, uh, not, not a whole lot of action going on there. And now there is full occupancy at that site. In fact, uh, Dan Fowler is our, our landlord for that site. But I'm really pleased because I can look out the window and see Abernathy Creek, which is one of our major uh, focuses of, or foci of our efforts. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Uh, I know I, I met some of you when we put in a community enhancement grant for the city and we've been working with Abernathy Creek Park and also with the Environmental Learning Center. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the reasons that I felt it was important to have this office was because we're about caring for these watersheds. And if I have to look out there every day, then I know who I own, who owns me and who I need to be taken care of when I look at that creek. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to just bounce back for a second. Um, AmeriCorps uh, is a, a fabulous program that I've worked with before, and we uh, were successful in recruiting an AmeriCorps member, Derek Palmore, who is our uh, stewardship involvement coordinator. Derek's been with us since September uh, through... Uh, kind of an unfortunate circumstance. A watershed Council in the Sandy River Basin uh, is no longer a part of the Watershed Council constellation. And they had an AmeriCorps member, uh, and we were asked if we could take her on. Uh, Willow Michaels is her name. And I can say that Willow has very successfully transitioned to our organization. She's working with us as our community outreach coordinator. So uh, we're fortunate in that regard. Uh, so I have two, two team members until the end of July at this point. So it's the three of us out of that office. Uh, very important uh, part of the work is laying a framework. Uh, so thinking about you know, prioritization. And the uh, Abernathy Creek uh, is one of the more important or perhaps the most important creek in the watersheds that we work with because it still has runs of coho, native coho. Uh, it also has steelhead and lamprey, Pacific lamprey. It has cutthroat trout. It has opportunities in the future potentially to restore chum salmon, which were once there and have been extirpated. But I want to focus for a moment on coho because we're a part of the Clackamas River Basin in the sense that we work in a partnership called the Clackamas Partnership. And that has been an energizing feature for this watershed council. So we work with three other watershed councils, Clackamas River, uh, the North Clackamas Watersheds Council, and Johnson Creek. And of those, we have a coho run here that is very, very important to this community. I was talking with a member that we're working with right now, the community who owns property along Abernathy Creek, grew up in Gladstone and remembers how important coho were as a part of Abernathy Creek. And he's not so convinced they're there anymore. Well, our, biolog our biologists that we work with, their rapid bioassessment showed they are there. And the good habitat for them is upstream. But we need to make it better. And so that's a part of what this plan is about, is it identifies 24 prioritized projects for us. It's my marching orders to try and fund those projects and to restore habitat within the creek. I'm going to move along a little quicker. You don't have a timer on me over here, so I'm going to try. I only have 12 slides. But uh, I mentioned earlier the community enhancement project. That's moving right along. Uh, we've been w working with the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. We've also been working with the Community College. Uh, enhancement work has already occurred up there. Uh, Jerry Herman, you heard from earlier, Jerry's team at Rivers of Life Center has been a partner with us. We've planted native species. We've removed a lot of invasives. This guy to my right 
uh, just helped us clear out a dumpster about as big as this space right here and full to the top of invasives from Abernathy Creek Park. And we closed the door on that one. Um, I didn't get to pull that photo into this presentation tonight, but we're working really hard to uh, enhance the, the community uh, through that work. So, uh, and, and I should mention that Abernathy Creek Park, starting in May, if our uh, permit is successful with planning, we will have uh, construction of a trail there along the shore. Uh, Holcomb Creek is the uh, first habitat. I don't know what I'm missing here behind me. No eyes in the back of my head. But. We, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because I'm sure that's a distraction. So the, the AC or whatever kicked on, and we feel like we smelled something uh -oh. off. And so, yeah. yeah, so staff are investigating to make sure that everything's okay with the building. But please continue. Okay, I'm sorry you. for the yeah, interruption. Feel free to give me the, the cut sign if we need to. I will. I will definitely <laughs> let you know if we need to. You know, the city manager looked at me and asked me if it was just him. And I was like, nope, it's it. Check it out. So that's what they're doing. They're just checking the okay. building. So go ahead. The alarm sounded. We need to look. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. <laughs> so Fair enough. so well, apologies I... for the interruption. It was definitely very noticeable, I know. But continue. <laughs> no worries. I can beat feet fast. So, uh, so Holcomb Creek, uh, if you're familiar, is a tributary of the Abernathy Creek system that crosses underneath Redland Road. And uh, the Holcomb Creek drainage is a very important one, uh, both for the Salmonids and also for Lamprey. And one of the first projects that the council is undertaking with a private landowner there uh, is uh, the Holcomb Creek uh, large wood restoration. So a big part of, and I, I'm not gonna repeat this over and over again, but you'll catch the theme here, is that Abernathy Creek is really starved for large wood. Large wood in a creek creates a structural dynamic that is important for capturing spawning gravel for salmonids and creating uh, complexity in the habitat. Uh, so in order to restore that, uh, watershed councils will often come in, do technical assessments of the site, and then we figure out what needs to, to happen in order to restore that habitat. And in Holcomb Creek, we were successful in getting funding both for a technical assistance grant to conduct design and for a restoration grant to actually put the wood in the creek, and we have a willing landowner there. Uh, so we just let the design contracts uh, just last week, and uh, we'll begin design this year. We will actually not implement until 2023, so there's an in-water work period there. Uh, but the design is very exciting, and I'm looking forward to that project. So uh, jump to another one. This project will be happening this summer, and this is, this is more the bells and whistles style because this is helicopters moving large wood into the Newell Creek Canyon. Uh, I imagine you're familiar with Newell Creek and the, the new nature park that uh, Metro opened, which is fabulous if you haven't been out there. And I know the council's history goes back to planting some trees down in the the bottomlands there uh, as a part of the habitat restoration. But uh, this summer I've been working with my colleague at Metro and that project uh, will begin here. Uh, we still have yet to, to have the specific timeline, uh, but we were out last week viewing the site, uh, Doug and myself and our two staff members. And uh, this, is, this is going to be some exciting work. This is uh, over a hundred large pieces of wood that will be coming in. Uh, it will impact uh, traffic along 213 uh, because of the helicopters and the, the wash of those helicopters. But is each of the, and we don't want bias, we don't want to create a traffic jam with people watching because it's pretty cool when you watch these helicopters. I've, I've been a part of this type of restoration before, uh, and it is fascinating. Uh, but this will be an opportunity to really gain on uh, the Newell Creek system. And Newell Creek's headwaters, if you don't know it, are actually up at Clackamas Community College. So they're at the Environmental Learning Center. And Jerry, back when that facility was established, did some very interesting work. And I know the council was involved in uh, improving the habitat up there and reducing the amount of inflow of pollutants there. So uh, stand by for that. There will be a lot more information coming out about Newell Creek here in the near future. Question, pause. Um, so I imagine this, this, that's an amazing project, and I imagine um, 
it's pricey, and I imagine it's a long, lot of work involved in getting to this point. Um, those of us that know Oregon City's history know that we're usually on a 30-year timeline. I assume the reason in terms of floods, major floods, and mm -hmm. I assume that one of the reasons there's not a whole lot of lumber and trees in that creek is because of the massive floods that we have. Um, the last flood was 1997. If you do the math, we're not, you know, far away from the possibility of having another major one in the next five years or so. Um, what does that do to a, a project like that, um, you know, is in terms of timing and in terms of really considering the best time to do it? You or are we, are we risking a huge investment to something that's going to wash down the river in five years or so or whatever? You bet. Uh, that is a great question, Commissioner Smith. And I'll, I'll offer a short answer and then a little bit longer answer. And then if we want to talk offline, yeah. I'd be happy to talk more about it. Uh, short answer, uh, in order to gain the permits for this project, there is a requirement called the no-rise rule. And the no-rise rule requires that whatever wood goes into the creek does not cause a rise of the creek uh, into a flood condition based on 25-year, uh, 50-year, and 100-year floodplain regimes. And so that technical aspect of that, and I feel very confident that Metro uh, worked with the appropriate attorneys. Um, you mentioned funding, too. The funding for this came from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board in part matched with Metro funding, and Metro is significantly invested in this project. So I feel confident that the technical aspects of that are covered. A little longer uh, answer to that. Uh, Abernathy Creek is a very flashy system, and if you're familiar with that, I, I was fascinated, and I actually shot a bunch of video. I started here in April, and I shot a bunch of video, and I... You can ask Doug, I, was at, I said, this is the lowest I'm going to see Abernathy, and I want to get that. And then I watched, and there was a good rainstorm event about a week in November where it really started mounting up. And I documented that as well. And I also know what Abernathy Creek Park is about. And so I understand. And I was in Oregon in the 96 flood. I know what that was about. That flashiness can actually be uh, addressed to some degree by putting more wood in the creek by creating more wetlands by slowing down the ascent of that water down the watershed and that that's a longer conversation and i'd okay. love to have it with you. i'm more i'm i was more concerned not so much about the the wood being a cause but that the wood is gone and yeah we have to start over again yeah and again yeah. i you know without getting too technical, but I would invite you, um, you're welcome to attend our watershed council yeah. meetings. We meet the second Tuesday and we meet virtually right now on Zoom. Uh, and uh, we do delve into that also at our technical advisor committee meetings. These highly engineered uh, restoration projects are different than simply placing a right. tree in the creek. Oh, I figure. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, but, you know, intuitively, I think a lot of people real, feel like, well, if I could just drop this tree into the creek, wouldn't that help? And the reality with Abernathy and with many of these systems, it's just going to flush down. Right. There's one right outside my office. <laughs> I watched it flush down. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited about this project in particular. Um, this is off Maple Lane, and this is where uh, Abernathy Creek crosses underneath Maple Lane. Three property owners that we're working with there adjacent to one another, three very different individuals, but they are all committed to improving the health of Abernathy Creek's riparian habitat. So this is the, uh, the plants and the trees along the edge of the creek that influence greatly partly what you're talking about, which is the flashiness and the flood, uh, but also the shading of the creek. So Abernathy, uh, if you look at the DEQ, um, uh, impediments, the, the total maximum daily load problems with Abernathy Creek temperature is at the top of that list. And so this project will be working to restore riparian habitat and it's working in partnership with the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District and their Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, which is actually a U.S. Department of Agriculture program. So this will be working. In fact, the gentleman in, with the blue shirt there is an organic farmer. 
and he is dedicated to restoring that riparian habitat and continuing to grow organic produce for market. Um, we have a sheep farmer as well that is uh, going to be uh, fencing off their sheep from part of their pasture and also from the riparian zone. And then we have another uh, horse, uh, a woman who owns horses that we're working with there. So I'm very excited about that small grant uh, through OWEB that we just recently heard about. Uh, $15,000, but very meaningful work. And I'm hoping that will grow, uh, that project will grow for us. This one you helped with and are helping with, the Abernathy Shade Project. So we work with Public Works. Uh, we have three property owners in tomorrow. I'll be here at 7.30 in the morning to meet with the planting crew. And we will be putting in native vegetation along the banks of Abernathy Creek uh, with those three property owners. You can see uh, in these uh, slides, Justine, who is uh, one of the contractors that we're working with, planted a willow, and that's her a year later, and that willow is over her head. So uh, we're really, I'm working with uh, your staff member, Brian Monin, uh, and Brian's been great to work with. Uh, we're hoping to grow this project as well. We'd love to, to see more property owners along Abernathy Creek. Uh, this, is, this is really no, no bite. You know, the, the benefit here is we're going to remove those invasives, plant natives, try to accelerate their growth and get some shade back on this creek and cool water for wildlife. So I'm um, getting close to the end here, but I did want to uh, just highlight kind of where our, our support comes from. Um, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board established watershed councils 20 years ago or more. Uh, the, I remember when I wrote my first grant, it was the Governor's Watershed Enhancement Board. Uh, and watershed councils are really important in the community because we are non-governmental. We work with property owners, but we also work with public agencies. We are able to leverage resources. So when, uh, when I look at a dollar, if it's a dollar coming in from a private citizen or from a private donor, uh, I, I look at how to double, triple, or quadruple that dollar. What can I do to match federal funds, state funds, and other uh, private donations in order to really grow the project? And so what you can see here is that our revenue sources are very heavily focused on the state right now. And that's because we are part of the Clackamas Partnership. So we receive council capacity funding through that. We also receive support to, to participate in the partnership. Uh, right now, that partnership is looking at trying to develop some federal grant proposals uh, to leverage our state dollars against federal dollars and really grow our success. Um, and then we also do have some private uh, donations. Uh, and then on the expense side, you're looking at the, the principal expense is me. Uh, and the staff members that I work with are really part-time temporary right now. Uh, and then our office and then some operational expenses. So uh, we have a pretty small budget. Um, we're small, but we're powerful. Small, but mighty, I, I like to say. So, uh, and with that, yeah, I think uh, just, you know, I kind of threw a motto up there Doug hasn't seen before, but uh, restoring our waterways and building communities, I think is what that said. So I hope that wasn't too long. I just, I just want to give the tremendous recognition that we uh, need to give actually to both Public Works and uh, Parks and Recreation, and particularly Brian Monin and in Public Works has worked with us very closely, as well as John Waverly, and they have a great partnership with the city as well as with the Metro Regional Government. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Yes, uh, Commissioner McGriff? Yes, hi. Um, so how much of um, Abernathy Creek is actually um, navigable? And I'm talking about navigable by uh, human-powered craft. <laughs> yeah, great question. So uh, looking at the lower end of Abernathy Creek, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, you know that the I-205 widening project will make a significant impact on that. In fact, our council just heard a presentation about that, and they will be moving the mouth of Abernathy Creek. So that's, that's no small undertaking. If you were to paddle up that mouth, it wouldn't be very far before you'd encounter one of the longest culverts I've ever seen in my life. I've seen uh, that one. I have not traveled through it myself, but I know several people who have, both by boat and by foot. Uh, and it makes its way such that it bends, and so it's completely dark. You can't look through.
through it from one end to the other. It goes underneath Highway 99. It also passes underneath Main Street before it daylights just uh, the side of the railroad tracks. Um, there are fish passage issues in there we are made to know. And uh, one of my hopes is that we can actually bring some resources to bear there to improve that. Navigable. There is a yellow tandem kayak sitting outside my office along the bank of Abernathy Creek that no doubt someone navigated at some point and it's washed up there this winter and I intend to pull it out. Um, I don't know who owns it at that point, but I want to at least get it out of the creek. Um, I'm not sure, you know, at, at a, a high tide and a flood, a good flood on Abernathy, if you're a decent paddler, I think you could get up there. Are there. there are places in what yes. you're saying. Yeah, I mean, but it's not like Quite you could do that. So yeah. you, you talked and, to... and I didn't mean to be disingenuous. No, no, that's all right. I, 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 I also know that you can get up, uh, you know, up around uh, like Hidden Lake, mm -hmm. uh, that area. You're probably starting to push it a little bit. And then Beaver Lake and Mampano Dam would be an impassable impediment yep, yeah. further up. That's, what I, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. I, I, you know, of course, like Commissioner Smith said, I support, really like the, the project. I saw one of those helicopters that lifts the logs mm -hmm. uh, about two days ago as I was outside. And I said, oh, I wonder where they're going. But it's always kind of puzzled me about how it's possible, if it would be possible. I mean, there's so many logs at the, at, at the falls. It's like... I know that they're not all being used for rest. I mean, there's a lot of them sticking out that have washed down, and then we've had houses washed down, how, you know, other things washed down. And I kept thinking, why can't we get some of that debris out of there so it doesn't break loose and head on down the river? And it seems like there's a lot of logs there. It could be... Yeah, my, my guess is that at least 5% of my time over the next year will be about acquisition of logs. It will be focused on just that because it's actually pretty hard to get a hold of logs, get them for the right price, and get them to the right place at the right time. But um, it, it's we we've had offers of trees from Lake Oswego at a park where they blew down because we had all the ice storms and, and that. Um, and it, it there's a lot to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a simple thing. And we also are interested in the root wads as well. That's part of what keeps the logs in the stream and and into the bank. So. Uh, at some point, we really uh, will be doing uh, tours of North Newell, and I would love to offer, you know, for you to come out and, and kind of learn about how that works and what we're doing there, uh, because it's it's more involved than you might think, but it's at the same time we want to do it conscientiously. Right. Well, thank you to you and your board. I, I noticed that you didn't put the board in your board and your report anywhere. Or he doesn't even have pictures of us in there, do you mean? Well, I saw some pictures. I saw some pictures. I saw some pi I, recognize, I recognize some people, but, you know, the, but anyway, thank you to the board, even though they weren't named in here. Thank you yeah, to your... If, actually, if you look yes, at the picture I, there... Yes, I knew that's that who it was. Park, yeah, that's, that, that's that the board. That is board yeah. members. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're tireless. Well, they, yeah. uh, I wanted to make a comment on Abernathy Creek Park specifically. It... It probably isn't as valuable for restoration purposes, but it's one of the few places where the public can get and look at the creek. A, a, a creek is about 27 miles total, and there are very few places that actually the public can see. And yeah, that's, right. uh, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that we regard that as so important. That's right. Uh, and I, you know, I think for me, getting people to appreciate what Abernathy is because I don't think when you look at it sometimes that you realize what's going on there. But these coho, this is it. I mean, this is it for these fish. If we don't provide this type of habitat uh, and enhance it and start to grow populations of coho back, if they become extirpated in Abernathy Creek, it will be very, very hard to bring them back. And I think, you know, uh, the Clackamas gets a lot of attention. It's a big river system and it's very important. But these smaller populations are genetically very, very important to the overall health of those coho. And so um, that's one of my hopes, is really to get people to the shores and share that story with them. I, I want to talk about the navig uh, navigability of it. Yes, Excuse me. <laughs> the, uh, we know for a fact that hooded mergansers, wood ducks, sea otters, and, uh, and uh, beaver navigated well. <laughs> <laughs> River otters. 
I know. All right. Yeah. 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 I know. We'd I like to have sea <laughs> otters back in Oregon, but we're not there yet. I know some beavers and some ducks. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for coming tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been a good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Look forward to working with you. All right. Thanks. All right. Great. All right. So we still have quite a lengthy agenda, so I want to get moving on it. Um, we have the adoption of the agenda. Is there anything anybody needs to pull off the consent agenda? I really don't want to, but I have a really simple question about two things, and I think I know the answer, but I, so I have um, seven C and D. C and D? I got my question answered on seven D, so. All right, seven C and seven D. Uh, looks like we're going to pull those. Um, I think they will be quick. So we're going to put them. Amber, how about we put them at the top of the general business um, so that we can go ahead and take care of them. They're, they're, they go to general business anyway, but we'll put them at the top. Mr. Lewis, just a warning. They're coming to you, I think. I'll move um, the remainder of the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Wiley. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Adam Morrill. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. And Mayor Rachel L. Smith. Aye. Motion passes. All right, so we're on to, we don't have any public hearings for this evening, so we are now at general business. And so we're going to take up item 7C. Commissioner Smith, you have a question about the personal services agreement with DeSantis Landscape. Okay, so it's really both items. I, okay. I, I, it's a simple, I, this is city budget, correct? Okay, that's all I, that's what I thought. I want to make sure. 7C. Yes, that's a city budget. 7B is Can you speak up, please? Okay. I think you have to say that again. Okay, so it's, uh, yeah. 7C and 7D. 7D is out of, oops, just jumped on me. Just note that we can't hardly hear either one of you. So 7C, the staff report says it is grounds maintenance funds, street division oh. grounds maintenance funds. And that's also public work city, right? And, right. And, and right. the other one says general. Urban renewal grounds maintenance Urban fund. Urban renewal grounds maintenance fund. That's a that that line item, two sixty is a is a general fund line item, a city line item. Does it get billed to urban renewal? If it's a or is it the title says urban renewal grounds maintenance fund. No, I think what it what it what it happened was when the original challenge to the urban renewal and we kind of took everything out of the urban renewal budget but we still had maintenance that we needed to do on these properties that we owned so sure. it was it was being paid out of the general fund i can confirm that with matt zook but i did have a conversation with him about that because if it's urban renewal we need to go to the urban renewal commission yeah. right. Okay. but right now they're both showing as general fund that's what yes okay all right um so we still need uh, motions on each one of these to essentially authorize the city manager to execute the amendments. And we just put them together? Can we put them together, 7C and 7D? Looks like we can. I'd like to move that we uh, approve item 7C, uh, amendment to personal services contract with DeSantos Landscaping, and item 7D, amendment number one to public works urban renewal landscape maintenance services personal services agreement. Is there a second? I need somebody to second this. I'll second for purposes of a vote. Let's do it. Okay. Mr. Wiley. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Abstain. Commissioner Adam Marl. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. And Mayor Rachel L. Smith. Aye. Motion passes. All right, so moving on in general business, uh, we're at 9A. We're at the transfer of real property located at 13776 Canyon Court to the city of Oregon City. 
Mr. Lewis. Can you hear me okay? Not yet. Yes. Yeah, can. Thank okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this item for you tonight is, is exactly as it read. It's a real property transfer. Um, we're trying to, this property has some history with it that um, some of you are aware of. I don't know that all of you, I'm sure Commissioner Marl was not on. I, I don't remember who maybe wasn't on before, but this property has some history. It's associated with the um, uh, Trillium Parks landslide. So there's plenty of dates uh, in this document that have been re referenced, but really I'm trying to cut to the chase, which is in uh, June 20th of 2018, the city commission at the time authorized the city manager to e execute a settlement agreement. So this is coming before you um, several years later. It's taken us a while. It's taken the property owner a while to kind of do what he was obligated to do. And I, um, so he has since demoed the wooden part of the structure and in that agreement that was his obligation to do. He's done that at his cost so there's no cost that the city has incurred but the foundation, the concrete piece of that when we take that property over is our obligation to demo and um, restore that area. So um, there's a couple of things I want to hit on with this report but, um, but one of them that's not really listed in there is just a reminder that this property in, uh, by virtue of where it's located is something that we're also trying to pair with the Trillium Park Drive um, landslide mitigation project. So we've been working on that project. We've, we're about at 90% design. We're trying to get that approved for construction this year. And this, uh, not this year, this summer. So it's, it's kind of imperative that we pair the two because the work involved in demoing that uh, concrete foundation is, is involved and um, th similar in terms of the kind of work that we'll be requiring of the, of the roadway work as well. So just kind of putting those two together for you. A couple of things that uh, we've listed in here is there was when we um, got back on track with the property owner, um, we had a determination that there were some back taxes. That property owner has since resolved that issue and paid those taxes, so there is no back taxes at this time. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is this order of judgment lien. I want to talk about that because there's uh, since learned um, something in here that we've stated incorrectly. Our, uh, our attorney has sh shared some s something about that, so I'll get to that. But before I get to that, I wanted to talk about this property owner and how I've kind of viewed it because it has been a long time. I, rem I remember when uh, the building official deemed this property a dangerous building. It had tenants in it at the time. And, you know, I remember feeling pretty terrible about the fact that this is a property owner. I don't know much about the property owner, but uh, I, I was put myself in their shoes and thinking about the, the, the problems associated with demoing a, a rented property, right? He basically was a complete loss. I know from some of our negotiations with the uh, insurance companies uh, would and wouldn't cover on that, and they didn't cover much. So um, it was a total loss for this particular property owner. So I guess we've always, even with the schedule, and the fact that it took several years, um, it's, it's been my decision to um, tread lightly with that and kind of continue to keep working with them. And they have met their obligations. So the other thing is the city didn't incur any relocation costs associated with those property owners, even though code kind of has some provisions for that that could have come our way, but it didn't happen that way. So, um, and then um, the terms of the settlement agreement, like I said, although it was late, they were met. So, um, so with that, just item number two, the order of judgment lien, we've suggested three items and it's item A, the last sentence there that says the lien will continue to be assessed um, to the Bartholomews who are the property owners, even after the property is transferred to the city. Um, that is um, what I'm understanding and Carrie, you can help me out here if I say this wrong, but that is incorrect in that the, that lien stays with the property, not with the property owner. So, um, so there's um, a $7,844.75 lien that was placed on this property um, because of some of the yard cleanup 
that didn't occur. In other words, after the property got vacated, it sat idle for a long time. Code enforcement uh, enforced on that. That took them some time to resolve. They ended up taking it to court and there was this, this lien that was placed on this property. And in talking through that with our code enforcement group, we were feeling, you know, this project in general is nearly a million dollars worth of construction projects. So when we talked to code enforcement, our ask was, well, what are your real costs? How much of this was fine or um, oh, um, punitive. punitive? Thank you. Um, and how much of it wasn't. So that's why we've broken out these other costs. So really there's uh, $5,700 of this lien that we, um, we either need to pay as a, from one department to another, or we need to ask the, um, the municipal court, and Carrie can explain how that could happen, but it sounds like a fairly simple transaction to ask the judge to change that such that we forgive a portion of the loan. And that's what I'm hoping for, because we have a lot of expenses coming out of the transportation fund anyway, and, uh, and I'm trying to limit that. So, um, so anyway, we, we, our recommendation is that we um, that the commission authorize the bargain and sale agreement consistent with the uh, agreement that we've already signed and then to give us some of your direction on how you feel about that lien whether we should pay it in full and or should we ask the judge to modify the lien so can you clarify the the current property owner uh, the Bartholomews, they're aware of the lien on the property and essentially are just not paying it. Is that correct? Right. That's where we're so at. So far. And so, so if far. we want the they're just making sure in our terms, so if we want the property, which it sounds like we have an interest in the property, um, our options are to um, reduce the amount that this property owner you know, would still have maybe some portion to pay um, and we pay portion. I mean, those, those are kind of so the options, but I, I, I'm just, have we talked to this property owner? Do we know why? I mean, what makes us think that they're, this property owner is going to pay? They're probably a wash their hands of this and are ready to move on would be my guess. Right, that's that's where they're at. And like I said, they, we haven't incurred any expenses on this property. When they demoed the wood structure, there was a provision in there that if they exceeded the first $10,000 right. to, to, to do that work, that the city would then pay in a, the next up to $10,000. That never happened. So at this point, the property owners incurred all the costs, including the 100% the loss of the structure and the cost to demo and he's turning that property over to the city. And uh, the, the city's intention there is nothing more than to one control that no new development would ever occur on that property and to restore it to match the natural nature of the rest of the adjacent um, homeowners association land. Right. Commissioner Donald. So the lien, has it been recorded? I understand it has, yes. Okay. So what we're saying is there's a recorded lien against the property. It, the lien travels with the property. It was liened by the city against the property, and now the city's going to take possession of the property. Yes. So we're going to record it. We, we have a lien to satisfy against ourselves or else move for a dismissal or mm -hmm. a reduction. Right. Would, so excuse mm -hmm. me. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. Uh, um, we would, we, would, we, would fought, we would go to the judge and to record a satisfaction of the lien. Okay. That basically we were with we we're, we're withdrawing the request for a lien. It's not a vacation; it's a satisfaction. But it essentially says, "Look, judge, just issue a satisfaction. We recorded against the property. Then it's clear." That would be the course of action I would prefer. It, otherwise, it's a bunch of yeah fun with numbers, and we're just trading dollars. I wouldn't. Let's let's do what you suggested. Yeah. I agree. Would you like to make a motion? We need a motion um, regarding the yeah the bargain and sale deed agreement. So directing the city manager to essentially sign the bargain and sale agreement, transferring the ownership, and then address the, the judgment lien. What we what we proposed was the um, code enforcement has incurred some costs, so we want to make them whole as well because their department incurred that. But the balance, the $5,700, is what we'd ask the judge to. 
I don't think that's what we're proposing. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. I think, want to, I think they want to forgive the lien entirely. That's, that's yes. accurate. Okay. Are there comments by Captain Davis regarding code enforcement and any need to reimburse it? Welcome, Captain uh, Davis. Uh, good evening. Uh, <laughs> I, I just want to add that the code enforcement did incur quite a few costs. Um, if you go into the judgment uh, that's part of the packet, it'll explain everything that code enforcement did. We had a petition for a warrant uh, to clean that. Um, the property owner didn't know all that stuff. So um, there is roughly $2,200, $2,150 that we have paid out to take care of that property. Um, the rest was a fine imposed by the municipal court judge. I don't know why those fines are what they were. Um, but again, yeah, we I think it's twenty one forty four seventy five with no interest is what we paid out of pocket uh, to take care of this. So the the proposal or the discussion is that if we if we were to try to want to reimburse the code enforcement department, though, I mean, going back to this homeowner who took three years to try to demo it, lost their their whole house. Um, I mean, to go back and ask for a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, surely the transportation fund, who has a few million dollars, can handle another fifteen hundred dollars or something, right? <laughs> That's the direction of the commission. Yes, we, if, we're, we're not going to quibble over two thousand dollars. There was some real costs that we did pay for. Okay. Thank you. It was my opportunity to make you speak in that microphone because you always show up and, and you always get left off the hook. So, Captain Davis. You never gets to say anything. You, you never say anything, so it was my chance to uh, put you on the spot. And Chief Van will probably be really happy about that. So, all right, we'll return. Um. I was just enjoying the humor of it all. I know, me too. So. <laughs> Commissioner Donald, do you have a motion? I'll see if I can get this motion right. Move to approve item 9A, the transfer of real property located at 13776 Canyon Court in the city of Oregon City with the stipulation that we move to remove the, or forgive the, uh, the entire lien. Entire, entire lien. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. I would like Any a, further discussion? Yes, I'd like a friendly amendment. I would like to see the $2,100 reimbursed back to code and for court compliance. I'll decline that amendment. I guess my question is, is... I guess we can vote on the, on the well, motion. Well, the, the, the report says that we could vacate portions of the lien, and I'm suggesting we vote, vacate all of it except for the part that's owed to that department. But in the end, it's all the transfer of monies with the, from the general fund to the operation of specific departments. So, okay, time out. So I believe the motion on the table would essentially mean that the city, depart, the city is going to handle that. Any fund transfers or whatever that you feel like you need to make to make code enforcement whole for this $1,500. I believe Commissioner McGriff's motion would be to... I can't. I don't know if you're trying to direct city staff on the moving of funds, or if you're saying no. that you'd like to make the homeowner, the property owner, pay the portion of the. No, I didn't portion. say that at all because I okay. think that's like trying to get money from a church. I guess. I guess what I heard was the original motion was get rid of the lien, go to the judge, and ask that yes. it be Basically. assigned. A satisfaction of lien signed. Right. Yes, and there right. would be no no transfer of funds between any departments. I think. Was, I think that's, that's what, what I heard. I heard that explains say. the motion that I made. Thank and you. then I think Commissioner McGriff wanted to make a friendly amendment to say that the Transportation Department would reimburse Should be making the code money. enforcement department for the 21 and change. Whatever it is and change, right. That was the friendly amendment that was rejected. Right, exactly. Well, we have the first motion on with no second, and we could vote on that. Rocky seconded. It was seconded. Yes, it was seconded. Well, let's, let's vote on it. If it loses, you can put forth your motion. Not going to lose. Well, so from a financial perspective, um, 
is there concern with the uh, so there's not if we don't change this motion there's not going to be a fund transfer and essentially code enforcement i mean eats it eats it that's Correct. essentially what's happening right. yes is there an opinion by code enforcement captain davis as to i guess you've already made your your statement like you you would like to have Mr. Lewis and his big pot of transportation money. Thank you very much. I know he's got money in my PD. has got a big pot of money, too. I'll just, leave that up to you guys. I, I just wanted you guys to be aware that there was real cost yes, of really. time and staff and money to pay for this. Uh, the homeowners were served. They do know of the liens. So, um, okay. So, I think she's asked for a, an amendment. Um, if the amendment's denied, he's not going to support As it. As I said. All right. Call the roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Oh, of course you have to call me first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard my statement. I'm not going to vote no just for that, but I think it's reasonable that we... Okay. Oh, please, for, so. Turn your mic on, please. I'll vote yes. Okay. So for the record, that was a vote of yes. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Adam Morrill. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. And Mayor Rachel Lyle Smith. I want it noted for the record that I tried to stick up for the police department. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, I agree with you, but I'm going to vote yes. Yeah. All right. I would have voted no. I'm but... pretty sure they'll get it out of us one way or another. They <laughs> always do that. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so I, th our, I think we're done with that item. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you for helping let's, us move through that one. Let's move on. Let's try to get to 9 o'clock, and then we can consider a, a break. How's that? Um, let's go. Yeah. 9B, intergovernment agreement between Wes and <laughs> City of Oregon City. That we may not get to this before 9 o'clock, but go ahead, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Well, we, we sure would like, like your support for this particular item. It's an intergovernmental agreement with Water Environment Services um, between uh, for INI reduction funding. And um, this has been before you before. There was some concern about the bylaws. And so this uh, report includes uh, the copy of the bylaws and the agreement that kind of... Uh, supports that. Um, this agreement is focused on reducing influent um, and inflow into the sanitary sewer system to avoid um, treatment plant expenditures um, over the next 20 years in the amount of what Wes is estimating of $120 million. This is a five-year pilot program for Wes, um, and I, I pulled that from, um, from their commission report this this item goes before the board of county commissioners tomorrow night and so i was just kind of catching up a little bit with that and read that this evening so it's a five-year pilot program they're anticipating um awarding 3.5 million dollars a year over the next five years um, we've got a pretty aggressive program i, f I feel like we're at the forefront of this, I know the uh, there there have been since our last meeting uh, confirmation from West staff that the city of Gladstone, the city of Happy Valley, um, yes Johnson City, small as it is, uh, the city of Milwaukee have um, approved the IGA. West Lynn has not. I didn't get a. Uh, I, got, I saw an email. I, I think they're struggling a little bit with the idea of uh, of. Uh, signing the agreement, to be honest with you, but I don't know that for sure. It was really an opinion from their public works director. But we've got the bylaws in here, talks about the membership. That was some, a concern. Um, you know, the, the more I've, I've talked to Greg Geist and Chris Story about this, the idea was to keep this at a technical level as opposed to a political level because it's sewer I and I. It's really one of those things that you wouldn't think would reach a, a project by project policy level decision. So, um, you know, and the criteria by which a project um, qualifies is pretty straightforward. And so I, I for us, based on our um, intention of projects, it's about a $6 million um, return 
of what our, our um, uh, customers are paying to Wes. So I, I see it as an advantage. I too have struggled with some of Wes's um, agreements over the years, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like this is a way to get some of that back and hopefully make a big difference because Oregon City has a lot to gain inside our city, our collection system itself. If we don't start pursuing our I and I, we're going to have more of those projects that uh, uh, we've already taken care of. Right when we when we had the um, the no build scenarios, so uh, I just feel like we got to get we got to make grounds on that. We've got a couple of contracts in the queue that we've been holding because there's no look back provision in the in the uh, agreement that Wes has provided. So we're we're kind of holding on to those agreements until we can get the city commission approval for this of this agreement. And assuming the board of county commissioners, what I heard from staff at Wes was they they anticipated. And evidently, it's been discussed. They anticipated no. Um, um, opposition from their board of county commissioners. So with that, I'm happy to try to answer any questions I can. Commissioner Smith. Um, who's on the line from West? I don't believe they're on they the line tonight. You mean they on, had, on Zoom? They had a... Or on Zoom or yeah, yeah, anyone yeah. that's yeah. here from West. Um, I want to say they have a meeting tonight. Yeah. Yes, they do that I'm supposed to be at. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I uh, at the, remember the last meeting I asked which cities had signed off and West kind of implied they all had. And then when I dug deeper, only Jan Johnson City had. So without any representation from West tonight to confirm that any other cities have signed off on this and for a lot of other reasons, which I've stated for the last decade, my vote's a no. Just real quick, we... Um because uh, we knew we couldn't get all the cities here, but we did go look at their um, their votes. So they were unanimous votes, and I think all of those, and that's why I listed. I listed it's in the report. Yeah, yeah, I listed yeah, those yeah you listed all so the jurisdictions. We, we, I had staff who looked at their commission meeting minutes and pulled that. So <clears> I want because because I too felt like I, I got a little bit um, a sleight of hand there at the last meeting because I had understood that they'd all so approved. They, but West Lynn still has not. West Lynn hasn't voted on it yet. Okay. Okay. Commissioner O'Donnell. So the report says Oregon City is going to spend $18 million over the next three-year period. Is that, is that in addition to the $6 million that you say West would put up? No, that's that's our, our that's our adopted capital plan. So I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe that we're planning to spend 18 million. So we have the we have the potential to uh, underspend by we these are reimbursement funds. So we will still have to budget to spend them, but we'll have a we'll have an added revenue that we didn't account for of six million dollars. Assuming we oh keep it simple for me. If it says 18, are we are we getting six of that back from Wes? Is that what you're saying? We get 33 uh, percent. So. Yeah, that's that's the other key words. Up to, up to, and it says that the, these actions will affect the savings for the processing of these affluence uh, to, to the tune of 120 million dollars. In theory, yeah, over 20 years. I haven't checked that math. Um, that that's kind of their statement, but. And of course, wow. we don't see the other agreements with the other cities. They're specific. They're the same agreement. It's the same agreement. It's the same agreement. Yeah. In yeah. terms of percentage, I think the the yep the thirty three percent is across the board. So, you know, assuming we have a qualifying project, whether it's a million dollars or ten million dollars, um, thirty three percent is what they're talking about. Now they do have some manual budget limits, but I it sounded like they felt like they had the funding to cover this. So, and it's a five-year program. So they want to do the, take a look do the rate payers uh, get any benefit from this? Is there a reduction in rate or rates are stable or rates are they're not reduced? Maybe they don't go up. Is there any statement about the impact of that? West will have to process less fluid, right? Because of less I&I. &I. I, I mean, the long-term benefit is reduction across the region of I&I &I means less capital expenditures in the long run. And I think Wes's approach would be not to necessarily um, reduce its revenues today if 
I think it feels a little bit miraculously that we're all as effective at reduction at I&I, &I and they truly see a horizon that says we're truly going to be able to spend a lot less money here. There may be, uh, there would be a benefit to the property owners, but... Um, okay. And for us, if you remember, this was another issue that we talked about with the commission was really to get to the level of reduction that we're hoping to, we, we need to look at that private property side of the lateral. And that's where I see some of the $6 million because I think our project expenses, you know, wouldn't cover all if we had to front all the cost to the property owners. So applying some of that 33% to the, the laterals is kind of a strategy I'm hoping to be able to implement. That's got to come back to the city commission, obviously, because so far we don't have authority to, to work on private property. The commission asked us to pull that. So we'd want, we still want to bring that back to you in a work session. But at this point, it's, it's a pretty clean 33% for any qualifying project. And I think that's a benefit to the city and the citizens. City and West Lynn, the two bigger biggest contributors of I and I, to your knowledge. I, uh, I think there's no. I don't know that. Okay. All right. So, any other questions? I, I don't have a question, but I, um, I went through the bylaws very specifically because of Commissioner Smith's previous concerns. And I think it's fairly clear and objective. It looks like this group is only going to meet quarterly, and it's all technical assistance. So I think it's, um, I think there's enough specificity in here for me to support this. Um, I like the idea of us getting some money back, and that's really was my goal because I understand what um, Director Lewis is saying about the real need that Oregon City has, and if we can reduce the impact to our our, our um, citizens on this project. Uh, of which I might be one, I don't know, but I think it affects us all and I'm, I'm willing to support this. All right, thank you, Commissioner McGriff. Um, I would agree with that comment. And the other thing is that this is a pilot, we can always withdraw at any time. So if for some reason we think things are going squarely or we don't think, you know, we withdraw from the pilot and we don't have a reimbursement option uh, while all the other cities may continue to participate in this program. So to me, this seems like a win-win. I'm not. I'm not sure why we would be hesitant at this point, um, given that we have opportunities to back out at any time uh, down the road. And I agree, I also reviewed the bylaws, um, given the, the concerns that Commissioner Smith um, voiced. And, and I would agree, the, the misinformation from the West person um, last time was unfortunate, but I appreciate staff doing the diligence to find out where we're at now. And I, I will say, I think at that time, though, if you look at the timeline and the timeline of when the votes actually occurred, um, I believe at that time, I don't believe many of these votes had happened. I, our last time we talked about this was in January. Um, yes. And if you look at the timeline, I, I really don't think most of those cities had had, had it on their agenda. So anyway, long yeah. story short, I'm, I'm supportive of this. Do we have a motion? Yes, I can move that we um, approve the West Intergovernmental Agreement as uh, submitted. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Wiley? Commissioner Denise McGriff? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? No. Commissioner Adam Marl? Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? No. And Mayor Rachel Al Smith? Aye. Motion passes. All right, so we've hit nine o'clock. I think we probably need to take a break. Um, we can take a quick five minute break. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do five minutes let's do that. and come back at 9.05. It actually looks like it's 9.01, so it's probably 9.06.
All right, we're back. All right. I'm calling the uh, Oregon City regular meeting back to order after our break. And uh, looking in the agenda, we are at item 9C. This is revocable long-term obstruction in the right-of-way at 508 4th Avenue. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. So I um, included quite a few pictures and mapping, or we, I should say we, because uh, some of this work is from others as well. But um, this is a property in Kanema, um, 508 4th Avenue, who has built a, uh, I would call it a um, landscape terrace wall that's in the right-of-way. And this... Um, be, um, this facility or wall, if you will, um, would, re would require a, um, uh, it's an encroachment into the right of way. So really requires a ro what we, ha how we've been processing these has been a revocable long-term obstruction um, in the right of way. So that's what the resolution is about. There's some um, good pictures that show um, the property before and the property after. They show the neighboring property with a, a, a wall that also has a um, long-term um, encroachment uh, uh, permit. So um, there's some history associated with this one. I didn't um, necessarily feel like I would go through it unless you want to talk through that, but um, we think this is the right way to, to process this one, so I'm just going to maybe um, leave it at that and let you folks share or ask any questions that you may have. Anybody have any questions? I have no questions. No. This is pretty straightforward. I mean, many of the properties in Kanema encroach into the right of way. I don't see this one as truthfully as any different. Um, like the majority of them do. I know why it's different, but I don't think we want to go there. Uh, the history of this piece of property. Um, so I'm just trying to stay focused on on the rock wall and how it's similar to many, many other properties in Kanema that are encroaching in the right of way. We're well aware of this issue. Um, so I think we need to be really careful here. I'm gonna I intend to be. All right, does anybody have a motion if there aren't any questions? I'll move to approve resolu resolution 22-12, remarkable long-term obstruction in the right-of-way at 508 4th Street. 4th Avenue. Just 4th, 4th Avenue. Avenue. Yeah. Thank you. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Wiley? Commissioner Denise McGriff? No. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Commissioner Adam Marl? Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. And Mayor Rachel Al Smith. Aye. Motion passes. I know that was a challenging one for us deep down, but um <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank we moved you it quickly. All right. So our next item on the agenda is uh, 9D. This is a personal services agreement uh, regarding our DEI work. This is our new goal for the city commission for this biennium. Mr. Foyles. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we're excited to present the personal services agreement with MGT Consulting. Um, this arrangement enables MGT, thank you, uh, consulting to support the city uh, to coordinate and deliver a comprehensive set of projects and initiatives that will help us achieve our DEI goals. Um, on Zoom this evening um, is Lamont Brown. Uh, he's the vice president of MGT Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Solutions. Uh, Lamont will act as uh, the project director for this work and will lead their their team of folks who will help us carry out the different components. Uh, we don't have a presentation for you this evening. Um, we just wanted to be here on hand to uh, for this introduction and to ask any questions that you may have. For members of the public joining this evening, um, during, as you mentioned, during the 21-23 biennium goal setting process, the City Commission made a statement and a goal to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, building a safe and inclusive community and organization. Um, 
the commission during that time articulated three strategies to support that goal. And this partnership will help us deliver on those strategies. Um, the scope of work um, was included in, in uh, the staff report and really we're just here to answer any questions or any conversation that you'd like to have. Thank you. All right, commissioners, any comments or questions? Yes, if I may, Mayor Lysmith. Mm -hmm. Commissioner McGriff. Um, I um, urge uh, approval of this. I participated in the um, review of their proposal and I felt that for what the city was going to be doing that they provided the best uh, service level for us. I think that um, we are embarking on some really exciting and, and probably slightly scary territory and moving this forward but it's our, one of our goals. And I think that the time is right now to do this. I think that our community is ready to do this. Our community has been asking for this and we asked for it. And I think that it's going to be really groundbreaking. And I think it's going to really set Oregon City apart uh, from our local, other local jurisdictions around us that we are moving forward with this. And I just, I'm really excited about us getting started. Commissioner Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to extend my gratitude to Commissioner McGriff for really spending a lot of time on this issue. Um, obviously, this is very important to me as well. And uh, we, I think uh, this is a great reflection of how Oregon City is moving forward uh, on this topic. And I mean, we, we now have the most diverse city commission we've ever had. And uh, I hope that with these steps, we will be able to continue that. So again, uh, thank you to Commissioner McGriff uh, for all her work on this. And I look forward to seeing the, the fruits of all that work. Yeah, we should thank the staff too. They put in a, they put in a lot of work and yes, they're all here in this room, <laughs> many of them. Anybody else? Commissioner Donnell or Commissioner Smith? <clears throat> I just note that the report says there were four respondents. They were evaluated by the team and they selected this one as being the best offering in response to that. So I can't take any argument with it. I say we move along. All right, is there a motion? A motion. Okay, pers uh, I'd like to move that we approve the personal services agreement with MGT Consulting for consulting services and delivery of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Wiley? Commissioner Denise McGriff? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Commissioner Adam Morrill? Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. And Mayor Rachel Al Smith? Aye. Motion passes. So uh, apologies to Mr. Lamont, who's on the Zoom. I, I, I hope you didn't have to. He's in a different state, yes. I hope you didn't have to wait a couple of hours and listen to us this whole time to us not even give you a moment to talk. So I should probably pause and say welcome and thanks for coming. It is 9 o'clock after 9 our time, so. It's been a joy listening the last few hours. But uh, we're very excited to uh, with the city. Uh, and uh, can't wait to get started. So thank you for your support. And um, uh, we really encourage just buy-in and, and, and engagement from all parties. So we're excited to uh, kick off. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, even in this late hour. I appreciate it. So. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Lamont. Looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. All right, and that Thank is, you, Tony. we're toward the end of our um, agenda. Are there any communications, Mr. City Manager? Not not tonight, Mayor, thank you. Anything from other commissioners? I just have one. Um, with the adoption of this personal services agreement, I think we may have an opportunity to uh, jumpstart our community engagement. I mentioned in um, during our dinner break that um, I was asking your opinion about us supporting uh, in cooperation with either our library or citywide that we have a Juneteenth celebration. For the last two years, I've participated in it through the auspices of Unite Oregon City. And since it's now officially a holiday in the state and it's now uh, one in Oregon City as well, and part of our uh, agreements that we have with our employees that I would like to get some support for moving something forward. It would be a very simple uh, program, uh, similar to what has been done in the past, but with a couple of more um, songs because we had a lot of requests for more singing. 
and uh, I'd like to be able to work with um, uh, Director Greg Williams on this. And uh, if uh, Adam would like to join again, he worked with me a little bit on this last year, that would be fantastic, or any other commissioner that would like to be involved. I see Commissioner Morrow has his hand raised. Commissioner Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm all on board for more singing, depending on who's doing that singing. Um, but as you, as you all know, um, I am in D.C. right now for the National League of Cities Conference, which just ended today, uh, and I will be flying back tomorrow. Um, today, we spent the day out on the Hill, and we met with all of Oregon's congressional delegation, um, and uh, so I was selected to speak to Congressman Kurt Strader about some issues facing our community, and I uh, reiterated our our um, gratitude that he has been supporting the Quiet Zone funding and uh, wanted to uh, express our wishes to see that through and uh, some other telecommunication issues uh, that are related to franchise fees and um, the public right of way. And so um, I'm looking forward to speaking more about it once I'm back. And uh, I'm glad this meeting did not go as long as I thought it would as it is uh, past midnight here. So thank you. <laughs> not over, Adam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that is true. So, All right. Um, I would like to be part of that, helping out in whatever way. Great. That'd be fantastic. So, yeah, so uh, it's not clear to me. Um, I think the question the, co the Commissioner McGriff was asking me at, over dinner was about um, it being a city-sponsored event versus... Um, I guess just a permanent event at the library. I know it was at the library last year and it, it definitely appeared like a city event last year. And so I'm not sure how many sponsorships we do of special events. We talked about it tonight in our economic development strategy. I don't know if you have comments on that. I think we just want to be thoughtful in having this discussion. Um, you know, everybody was aware during COVID, you know, we had demonstrations, protest, you know, we had multiple things happening in city rights of ways, on city parks, and we were pretty much not issuing permits. Um, Commissioner McGriff um, had a conversation with um, uh, Director Williams about Juneteenth, and now that it has been a a uh, federal holiday, a state holiday, we're negotiating in our contracts. You know, we just wanted to be upfront that, you know, is the commission comfortable with the library? You know, it's going to be a library park, you know, engaging more in a more um, official way um, to be a part of this. So I don't, I think that we're going to have a lot of discussions about what does it mean to be a sponsored city right. event or a mm -hmm. partner. Um, but I, I think it, more than the terminology, it's just so we just want to be upfront that we were going to do some event planning, mm -hmm. have the library engaged, and you know potentially work it as part of the DE project, DEI project that we're doing. So we see a lot of opportunities here mm -hmm. to, to, to be a part of an event that is probably going to be there anyway. <laughs> right. I could be provide an opportunity, if depending on how far along we are, for community engagement to get people to respond to some of the questions that were probably going to come out of this process. And it seems like it's a real win-win, you know, for us. I don't think I need specific direct. I just wanted to make sure we had a conversation as a group. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else from commissioners? All right. Seeing none, we are moving to executive session. Um, immediately following this, it'll take us a few minutes to get set up. But as stated on the agenda, we are moving to executive session, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>